Hello and welcome everyone to this new episode of Greatest Business Mind on our digital TV channel F15 by Forbes Dach. My name is Klaus, I'm the editor-in-chief of the German-speaking edition of Forbes. And in this format, on every Wednesday and Thursday at 5.30 p.m., I meet interesting thinkers, CEOs, founders, um, who try to think anew what our economic system, what leadership, and what managing this COVID crisis means. Today's guest is Roger Martin. He used to be the Dean of the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto. He was named as one of the top 50 business thinkers. Um, and he has written 11 and now has written a 12th book on what our economic system looks like, how it should change, what capitalism um, should look like and what it would be, what could look in the future. Um, I'm quite excited to have him today. Roger, thank you so much for taking the time. It is my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Klaus. Um, so there was a lot of talk and a lot of coverage on what this pandemic, the last three months we've seen, has done to the economic system, also the deficiencies it's shown. Um, what is your stance uh, on, on this? And maybe the question is, what have you learned about capitalism and the economic system we live in in the last three, three months you, that you didn't know before? Well, you know what, I, I guess I would say I've more had uh, concerns I've had about the economy confirmed than anything else. Uh, so, you know, six and a half years ago, I set out to do a project on the future of democratic capitalism, in part because I worried about some of the things that have that have come true with uh, with COVID-19. Uh, um, and that is that the economy is kind of obsessed about efficiency and in being obsessed about efficiency uh it isn't worrying enough about the resilience of the economy and i i think in many respects the covid 19 crisis illustrates the the need for resilience and the degree to which if you don't build resilience into your economic systems um they can crash more precipitously than than anybody would think when they seem to be kind of running along okay. Do you, was this, this, this obsession with efficiency, they sometimes call it, or this, this focus on efficiency, what, what, does the, what was this in the last few years or, or decades even? Was this cost cutting, maximizing profits? I don't know, what, what exactly is that when you talk about maximizing efficiency? Sure. Sure. I mean, it's, it, it, I think it's been, been a long uh, process, more like a, a 40 or 50 year uh, a process where, where we've privileged efficiency over, over anything else in the economy. So we just assume that, that more and more open trade it makes for more and more economic efficiency. So there's no bounds to how much to, to open up uh economies to to global trade um, we have assumed even though in the early 20th century uh the world uh starting with the the us but the world put in place antitrust uh laws to prevent even though a company might be most efficient for itself by dominating an industry and squelching everybody else like Stan, john d rockefeller and Stan, standard oil we said that kind of efficiency is not actually good for the economy, and so we'll prevent that. Well, uh, uh, in the 80s and 90s, in the US and the EU and Canada and other, and other places, there came an efficiency defense to, uh, to monopolization. And so now if you show you're more efficient, by monopolizing, uh, you are challenged uh, on antitrust basis. So it's been this sort of slow creep that says that says more efficiency is better, right? When we had the meltdown uh, of the uh, financial system in 2008, 2009, uh, people defended uh, the massive amount of derivatives. Remember, we we had uh, stack stacks upon stacks of derivatives upon derivatives that that were were ten times as big as the global economy in 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 value. And people said, "Well, yes, but it makes the the exchanges more efficient to have these these uh, uh, these derivative derivatives. The bid ask spreads on the market are smaller because of all these uh, uh, derivative products, and kind of." Nobody sort of asked the question, well, what happens if something goes a little bit wrong with, with them? And what we know from 2008-9, uh, how bad a little bit wrong could get you. 
those are all manifestations of this slide towards more and more efficiency. Now, I am pro-efficiency because having an inefficient economy is, is bad, but it, it's the classic case of uh, too much of a good thing isn't, isn't a good thing. We've gone past too much uh, of a good thing point and and now we are now we are seeing the kinds of things that that happen when you don't take into account that you need to balance a, a push for efficiency and you need to think more carefully about what you mean by efficiency we use bad proxies for efficiency so we say in the capital markets bid ask spread is the, is our proxy for efficiency no it's not it's not the the only one Companies will say labor costs, lower labor, labor costs. That's a, that's a good proxy for efficiency. Kind of, no, it isn't. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a good proxy for efficiency, the cost structure of monopolies. If by monopolizing an industry, they get their current cost to serve down, that's a good measure of efficiency. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. What's a measure of efficiency in monopolization is what will the, how will the market develop uh, once it's uh, uh, taken over by a, a monopolist and they stop innovating, they stop serving customers, they just start you know, kind of printing, printing their own earnings. So what's happened is that we've, we've gone along this, this vector of, of more efficiency is always better and we can measure those, uh, that efficiency in simplistic ways and then forget about uh, resilience. and, and We've got the manifestations of forgetting about resilience uh, that have now hit the economy. It's both COVID, COVID-19 and, and what's happening uh, with uh, the unrest right now in the, in, the, uh, in the US. Before we, I mean, we're already deep into the topics you also cover in your book, but <laughs> I wanna pick up on a point mm -hmm. you, you said before, because economic theory would tell us that competition leads to efficiency because companies have to be efficient. What you're saying now is that companies are arguing they are more efficient when they, are, when they have a monopoly. I mean, you could think of the tech giants, for example. Do you think we're sacrificing competition in order to get more efficiency? And isn't that somehow counterintuitive to what we've all learned in school that competition leads to efficiency? Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's right. I think, I think this is the idea of, of adopting, adopting these very mechanistic proxies for efficiency. Mm -hmm. So in antitrust, just to use your example, in antitrust, there are now kind of <laughs> interpretations, uh, Justice Department in the US, EU anti, uh, antitrust uh, uh, authorities that say, that, that, that essentially say you can defend your monopolization if you can show that you are a more efficient provider of the service. So we've thrown out, as you, uh, to, to what you pointed out, we've thrown out the benefits of competition. We've just said, we don't, we don't need the benefits of competition because we can demonstrate that at this point in time, and this is a classic kind of public policy case of the here and now, right? We can look at the cost structure and say, oh, you put those two companies together and we can take out this many costs, therefore they must be more efficient. And that's all we uh, pay attention to and don't pay attention to, well, what happens when a customer now who is only one provider says, uh, uh, you haven't fixed my, you know, you haven't fixed my cable uh, uh, television ser service and the company says, we'll do that when we feel like it. What is that? Well, that's an inefficiency in the mind of, of, of the, the consumer and the lack of competition in the minds of the consumer. But in the minds of the antitrust authorities, it's fine because, because the cable company has lower, uh, lower costs than would otherwise be the, the case. So it's, it's, I mean, when you think about it, it's just, it's, it's kind of an, a, just a bit of insanity, right? It's like we worship we worship at the altar of efficiency uh, and we define it so narrowly, right? Like labor costs is a really big one where we define efficient labor costs as low salaries, right? Yes, it is in some narrow sense, but if, you're, if your workers are not earning a living wage and come to work, you know, 
tired and exhausted, worrying about their kids with no day, day, daycare at, at home, you know, are they going to efficiently serve your customers, right? In a way that your customers will say, wow, that, that, that's great how I'm being served. No, they won't. And is it because they're bad people? No, it's because they're tired and worried and, and uh, completely un, unmotivated. So, so I think with this sort of doctrine of, of efficiency, um, I think, I think we've, we've, uh, we've just missed the, uh, the bigger uh, picture. And that's partially also because we have a very mechanistic view of, of the economy of, bus of businesses, uh, right? We don't, it, it is harder to model. Well, how much better will customer service be in a retailer? That's a good example. How much better will customer service be if our employees feel safe and, uh, and, uh, uh, and well rested? Just, just the right thing. That's hard to model, mm. right? You have to sort of have a have a view of human nature that says, you know, customers will care about the the nature of the of the service. They they will notice whether employees are are you know kind of tired and upset and short with them, or take the time to to help them, and that'll influence how loyal they are, and that'll influence how much they purchase, uh, etc. Those are more complex system uh, uh, things rather than a mechanistic thing. No, no, no. Exactly how many labor hours do we need on the store floor to make sure that the core jobs are being done? That's the mechanistic uh, view. And how little can we possibly pay to have people actually show up and serve those, those hours in the store? Right? Um, you know, if, if, if you have that mechanistic view, then you will push harder. You'll say, well, why don't we take wages down a little bit more? Let's offer a little bit less uh, for wages and see if we still can get people to show up. Uh, you'll experiment like that. And, and you know, you'll eventually, you'll eventually uh, uh, end up, end up you know, with, with uh, uh, the worst kind of labor, the worst kind of service, and customers won't show up in your store. And you'll say, gee, I don't understand why customers aren't showing up in our store uh, anymore. And they're showing up at that other store. Uh, and those silly people are paying twice as much in labor costs as, as, uh, as we are. Aren't they being silly and inefficient? Mm -hmm. No, in a more holistic way, they're being more efficient. And that would be the story of, of Costco, one of, one of America's absolutely most successful uh, retailers. Uh, they pay not quite, but almost double what the other, their competitors pay in wages, per hour wages. You'd say, well, that must make them completely inefficient. No, their sales per square foot are much higher. Their profits are much higher. Uh, they are probably the strongest retailer in America uh, uh, right about now. And you can say, but they're being inefficient. How can this be? No, they're not. They're being efficient in a more holistic sense uh, than their competitors who are being efficient in a really narrow kind of sense that doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't really uh, uh, matter. You, and we, we talked about it before and we, you mentioned it, uh, your forthcoming book, which is coming out in, in the fall of 2020, is called When More Is Not Better, Overcoming America's Obsession with Economic Efficiency. And you said at the very first question that you kind of, what you highlight in the book or what your theory or the thesis was before sort of was underlined through this crisis. Um, how much, I mean, you don't write a book in, in, in eight weeks. How much of the, of the book have you had to rewrite based on these, you know, events that we've seen or was it actually, were you so on point that the whole book still stands as it was? Well, I, I mean, uh, I, I haven't rewritten it at all, right? I, I, I've, I sort of felt that that would be, would be kind of uh, illegitimate or uh, inauthentic. Um, literally, the last edit of the uh, mine went to my editor for final editing on January nineteenth. Uh, so before before COVID, you know, kind of long long before uh, 
the tragedy in Minneapolis. Uh, um, so, and I could have probably gone back to the publisher and said, I want to change this, I want to change that. But I just thought that would be inauthentic. That's not, that's not, I did not write the book about COVID. I did not write the book uh, about George Floyd. Uh, I wrote a book based on concerns I had in 2013 and six years worth of work. And I'd, I'd rather just let it, let it stand. I mean, as it turns out, I, I mean, I, I think that these, these events this summer um, have illustrated that I wasn't <laughs> crazy to say I am worried about the path that American democratic capitalism, and I wanted to focus on, Amer uh, on, on America, but basically everything I say about America, I think of, I think of America as not in a good way here, as the lead case for these, these concerns. I think it's uh, more obsessive about, about efficiency than Germany. Uh, or or Scandinavia or or UK for example, so it, it is leading the way, not in not in a not in a good way. So whatever whatever uh, situation is in the US on the on the stuff that I'm talking about, I think applies elsewhere. But um, I think I was I was uh, uh, correct. I mean, I in 2013 there were pretty much zero mainstream calls for say socialism uh, in the US, right? And now, uh, you know, uh, large swaths of under 25 year olds will say, no, I, I prefer socialism to, uh, to capitalism. And that, that was a premise of the book that we're, we're heading in a direction where, where uh, democratic capitalism will come under a siege. And it, uh, it has in more kind of profound and aggressive ways than I think almost anybody would have said in 2013 when I, when I started the work. So I, want, I, I started the work, finished the work, and I want to let it, let it stand as, as, uh, as that, not, not have revisionist history at the, uh, at the end of the process. Do you think that, that possibly because you, you, you were, you stated, American democratic capitalism. Do you think that we might see in the future democracy and capitalism, which we always thought needed each other, um, you know, sort of drift away from each other? Maybe China has a new model of how capitalism can work without demo democracy. Do you think that's something that could happen? Absolutely. In fact, I think it, I mean, I think it is happening. And I think it's one of the scariest things for me one of the scariest things in the world is that China is showing that you can have totalitarianism and capitalism uh, kind of work. Uh, and, you know, if totalitarian capitalism uh, kind of <laughs> works, it's going to be a miserable world. Uh, I mean, like how many, how many people in the, let's say in Europe, how many people in Germany would give up German citizenship to move to China to become a Chinese citizen. You know, what percentage of Germans do you, do you think would, uh, would do that? I would guess a very low number. Maybe one tenth of 1% would be my, would be my guess. Why? Because they would miss democracy. They would miss democracy a lot. They would, they would not like uh, to, to be told, oh, the state wants to build a highway and we're, you know, we're plowing your house under uh, uh, and to not be able to say, but I want to, I want to protect uh, that. Uh, and in fact, all my, all my neighborhood would, would like to band together to protect itself. No, no, you, you get shot. Uh, so, so to me, to me, um, I think it's the job of the, you know, the liberal democracies of the world to show that we can continue to have this, this, I think, uh, for me at least, it's a beloved combination of democracy and capitalism. Uh, but we can't have the core. The core uh, premise of the book is that democratic capitalism only works when the 51st percentile family feels like it's advancing over time. Right? And I use that. Maybe it's not exactly that family, but you know, metaphorically, if you want to have democracy, 51% of people have to support it uh, in places like 
you know, Germany and Canada, that's more complicated with multi, many parties. It's sometimes a minority uh, of two parties uh, together, as opposed to the, the U.S. system, which is which has converged on this two part two party uh, system. But fifty one percent of people have to say, "Yep, this is working for 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 me, and I will I will uh, support it." And uh, you know, in the Great Depression, uh, we, what we know is in the in, in the Great Depression, which was you know. In many respects caused by the United States, but became a global global uh, uh, phenomenon. Uh, uh, many of the de developed countries in in the world, the advanced economies in the world, went went either communist, fascist, or socialist. Uh, and and uh, I don't I don't want to see that happen happen uh, again. Uh, and it happens in my in my view when the me median family and the people around the median family give up and say this doesn't work for me we have to make it work for them like i think democratic capitalism will only prosper and survive if it has the following attributes the median family feels like like in most years life will never be perfect there'll be economic downturns yes but in most years it its prospects are advancing Two, we uh, tax the richer families who do, are doing better to make the lives of the, the uh, poor families better off. And the society agrees with that uh, uh, fundamentally. And lastly, there is a true ability of with, with the support of, the, of, those, of those tax revenues and a, and a flexible economy that those who are at the bottom end of the income distribution can work their way up the income distribution and the lazy ones at the top can work their way down the, the distribution, right? Uh, if, if that is, that is a good society and a society that will make democratic capitalism prosper. And I think it's the best system uh, that we've yet seen in the world, but it doesn't happen automatically uh it it happens with you know care and attention what as our viewership is mostly you know executive ceos founders um, entrepreneurs which which advice would you give to these leaders that can make a difference within their organizations or maybe within their communities or, or societies all what do you think they should do i mean we, we've touched upon you know thinking efficiency not in such a broad term, but if you can give concrete advice to a founder watching this, what would you tell them? Sure. Well, it would be, be careful not to uh, create uh, simple proxies for efficiency uh, is one. Uh, so recognize, recognize that, that it will take kind of multiple measures of how you measure uh, yourself uh, that will protect you from Uh, kind of, kind of uh, uh, a race to the bottom on efficiency. Kind of, that's that's uh, that's uh, one. Um, two is is recognize that that slack, all slack, is not bad. It's not something to be to be uh, uh, wiped out, right? And so so uh, kind of wiping out, uh, you know, kind of excess excess labor uh, labor costs by taking taking it down so that you don't have any any labor slack is, is not uh, in your interests uh, in, in the long uh, term. So recognize that, you know, the, the father of total quality, uh, W. Edwards Deming, you know, uh, had methods for getting rid of, getting rid of slack that was unnecessary, but he was, uh, he was the proponent of, of slack Uh, it, there, having an optimal amount of slack is is critical, and so so I would I would I would listen listen and listen closely to to Edwards uh, Deming on on uh, slack, and and I and I and I would just say that that um, the whole world of business has moved in the direction of reductionism, right? It's to say. There's a silo called HR and a silo called marketing and a silo called operations, et cetera. Uh, and you break down the, the, the business, the economic machine into these individual uh, silos and managing, manage them that way. Now, 
I think, honestly, that the entrepreneurs don't do that. Right? They say, hey, this is, a, this is one big system and I'm trying to, I'm trying to produce a, an outcome for customers. As companies grow, they siloize to a greater uh, extent. And that is based, I think, on, a, on sort of a machine metaphor, right? Uh, it's like a car. You know, we can have a silo which is powertrain and a silo which is, which is heating, venting, uh, and, uh, and uh, air conditioning. We can have a, one that's safety. We can have one that's steering. Uh, and we'll send the engineers off to maximize each of those and we'll add them up in their car. It's less like a car than it is like the Amazon jungle, where it is, it is a complex adaptive uh, system. A business is a complex adaptive uh, system. And we've got to get away from the idea that we can siloize things and break them into pieces and realize that it is holistic. Our HR policies will impact our customer service and and our our uh, effectiveness in in the factories uh and we have to we have to understand that our relationship with our customers right is not a simplistic one that can be in the, that can be based on kind of one measure or, or, or one simple simple thing so i i would i would say Turn your back on on this reductionist siloized uh, version. Make sure you're using multiple measures, not just not just focusing on on one measure. And recognize Slack is not an enemy to be gotten rid of. It's a it's a variable that you that you must optimize, not uh, not minimize. Those things will will help you contribute to a, a, a world that is that is going to be better for a future of democratic capitalism. Getting, getting to the end of it slowly, but, but surely, um, if you look at everything, I mean, you said you, you've researched this for six years, you've, you've sort of occupied yourself with these topics for much longer, two, three decades. If you look towards mm -hmm. the future, let's not say 15 years, but maybe two, three, five years, are you hopeful or fearful when you look at, at what's going on with democratic capitalism in the US, but also maybe in Europe? Well, I'm, I only do this work probably because I'm a, a hopeful guy. So I, 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 remain, I remain hopeful uh, that we'll learn from these experiences and, and uh, kind of do the right thing. I have a concern that we are just still, we're, we're, we're in the last throes of a, a this kind of kind of overly mechanistic, overly kind of scientific uh, um, approach to how to manage uh, a complex system, um, and so I I fear that we've got a few. <laughs> a few more years of and a, a few a few more kind of bumps until until there's a full recognition that that no this is a complex adapt, adaptive system this is not a machine and let's stop thinking that we can perfect this uh, uh, this machine so uh, I I hope for the, for the long. Uh, the long run, I do, uh, but we're not on a not on a great uh, uh, vector. And I think, to a certain extent, the COVID COVID nineteen demonstrates some of the some of the foibles uh, uh, close. I mean, everybody said you have to be uh, absolutely scientific in everything you do. Right. Well, if they were listening to the father of science, that's Aristotle. Aristotle created science. It was formalized 2000 years uh, later by Bacon and Descartes and Galileo and Newton, but he, he created it. Um, he pointed out something that we've forgotten. He said, the scientific method that he created right, uh, was for the part of the world where things cannot be other than they are. So what he meant, went, meant by that is, this is the part of the world where things cannot be other than they are. If I let go of this pen, it'll drop. 
It'll drop in Germany. It'll drop in America. It dropped 100 years ago, dropped 10 years ago. It's going to drop 100 years, years from now. That's, that's where you take the past data that you have from the past and use it to predict the future. Why? Because the future is identical to the past. And so you use that. And he said, but he said, and this is what's been ignored by the world, and especially in the last, last 100 years, been ignored. He said, there's another part of the world where things can be other than they are. So you probably, I assume, Klaus, have one of these things, right? Yep. And, and it's probably within one arm's length of you right now because we get, we get hives. We break out in hives if it's more than an arm's length away from us. That was not the case in 1998. Mm. Why? Because there was no such thing in 1998. The first smartphone was in 1999, BlackBerry. Um, that's part of the world where things can be other than they are. And you know what the father of science said in that part of the world? Don't use the scientific method. The father of science, not just some, some guy off the street, the guy who invented science said, don't use it. And why, why wouldn't you use science? Well, it's because science is about analyzing fact patterns from the past to draw inferences. As Aristotle said, to demonstrate the cause of a given effect. Well, if you analyze all smartphone usage and patterns of smartphone usage from prior to 1998, what would you find out? There's no smartphone usage. There's, you know, you can't demonstrate any smartphone usage because mm -hmm. there wasn't a smartphone. He's, and he said, in that, in that world, you must imagine possibilities and choose the one for which the most compelling argument can be made. What we've done is said, we will use scientific analysis for everything. The father of science said, use it for some things and not, and not uh, others. Uh, and all of that, is consistent with this problem of viewing the world as some kind of machine that works a certain way. No. What Aristotle said, which is quite lovely, I think, is that in the part of the world where things can be other than they are, the job of human beings is to be the cause of the effect they want to see. And so I think that we have to exercise that, that muscle and not argue that if you can't prove it from past data, you must not do it. The father of science said, that's a bad idea. Yet we're saying in his name, in some sense, in the name of science, we're saying, we're, we're saying you should always be scientific, right? The reason we love Steve Jobs as a CEO, what did he do his entire career? Imagine. He imagined possibilities and then made compelling arguments for them. And then what did he do? Dent the universe. That's what he said. That was his job was to dent the universe. Aristotle would have been pleased. Um, and, um, and so we've got to recognize when we can and should use science and when we've got to go beyond science. So in, the, in COVID, right, just think about it. In COVID, we used all the scientific evidence from the past to declare what the curves would be. I'm sure there was a curve in Germany, right? There was a curve in the UA, US of 220 to 2.2 uh, million people. We used all the science that we had at our disposal to say that's going to be the curve okay. if we don't, if we don't uh, do anything. right? And then what did we do? We did what Aristotle said we should. Imagine possibilities. Uh, and choose the one for which we can make the most compelling argument to ourselves. This makes sense based on this anecdotal evidence, that anecdotal uh, evidence, not science. And we came up with lockdown plans. Okay. And what, were the, what was the job of the lockdown plans? Flatten the curve. Right. Now, if we would actually been scientific about that, we wouldn't have flattened the curve. We would have said, no, we can scientifically say what the new lower curve is. Right? We couldn't. We said the curve is this big curve, but we want to try these things to flatten the curve. Aristotle would have approved entirely. There was no science behind those. Right? You know, we're just imagining a better possibility. And then go out and try that. 
But when Sweden tried something else, what did everybody say about Sweden? They, get- won't, they weren't adhering to the international scientific consensus. It wasn't an international scientific consensus. Unless you mean it was a consensus of people who call themselves scientists. But I think generally when, when you talk about an international scientific consensus, it's a consensus based on science. There was not science behind the lockdowns. The strategies that everybody used were not scientific. Yet, when somebody does something else, we, we claim they were not being scientific and that's bad. We've got to get over this notion, right? that we can create new futures by being scientific. You can only create new futures by using imagination. And if we do, if, if we've, we've attempted to learn the opposite from COVID-19, and I think that's a real, that's a real uh, uh, shame. That is not the lesson that we should take from, from uh, uh, COVID-19. We flatten the curves by being unscientific. And I'm not, that's not a criticism, right? That's a fact. Uh, and if only we would learn that, I'd be more confident. This is a long answer to your question, but I'd be more confident if we, if we learned where we have to be rigorous and scientific and where we have to use human ingenuity and, and, and uh, uh, and creativity. And I think we have to use human ingenuity and creativity right now to save the future of democratic uh, capitalism. Roger, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for your, for your insights. Um, everyone who's watching this, uh, the book is called When More is Not Better, Overcoming America's Obsession with Economic Efficiency. It's out, I think, in September this in year. September, September 29. Uh-huh. And as we've said, it's not just for Americans, it applies to everyone who's living in a democratic capitalistic society. Um, we are back. Thank you for everyone who's watching, first of all. We are back. I am back here tomorrow with the CEO of IWC, uh, Chris Granger Eric, to see how the luxury watch industry is doing in, this, in these crazy times. Roger, greetings to Florida. Thank you so much for taking the time and hope to talk soon. Uh, that would be great. And thank you so much for, uh, for taking the time with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you.